thing about that industry. There's no, I just, I just jump in with two feet and swim. Yeah. Actually, I was the guy on the phone, and it was the guy in Phoenix on the phone. He was just kind of telling me about all of the issues that they're currently on, what's going to be on my plate on day one. Ready? Let me just... Alright, I think we're live. So I would like to welcome everybody to our Norwood City School District Board of Education Committee of the whole meeting for Tuesday, July 7th, 2020. Uh, Julie, please call the roll. Mr. Atwood. Present. Cole. Present. Miss Ballard. Present. Mrs. Raver. Present. Mrs. Rare. Present. All right. Everybody, please stand, and the flag is at the other end of the room for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So now that we've done those housekeeping issues, we're going to move straight on into item number three on our agenda, which is our discussion items. And we're going to kick it right off the bat with the presentation of our back to school plans um, by Superintendent Ronan. And before you get started, I just want to say that, you know, there's been a group of people that have worked on this for quite some period of time since we have been out of school. Um, this is just a plan that we are going to discuss. So please come with your questions, colleagues, so that we can dissect this plan and turn it inside out and which side way and make sure that we have a good understanding because the discussion of this is what's going to determine what we do next and whether or not we want to have further discussion, whether or not we want to call a special board meeting in order to concrete something so that way the district has a direction. So the discussion that we have here today 
and, and I want to have a, a very um, thoughtful and fruitful discussion, but this discussion we have here today will determine the direction that we go next with this. So with that, I'll turn it over to Superintendent Rundle. Oh, thank you, President Adwood. Yes, I would like to follow up by saying we uh, surveyed our families and 83% of them said they wanted to return to school in person. So once we realized that, that 83% of our families were saying that, we got a group of almost 50 individuals together, uh, seven or eight uh, people from teachers and um, Ed aides, the principal, the food service people from each building to put together a document that we hope that we will continue to get input on. And this is our first uh, draft of how to return to school safely. I do want to mention that the Hamilton County superintendents, there's 23 of us, we talk weekly and we also um, have the health commissioner for Hamilton County on the phone. So most districts in Hamilton County at this point in time are looking at an in-person start. The one exception is Cincinnati Public with all the transportation issues, et cetera, are looking at a different model. But the rest of us are looking at um, an in-person return at this moment in time and there's several reasons for it the American Academy of Pedi uh, Pediatrics on June 25th says they strongly advocate that all policy considerations for the coming school year should start with a goal of having students physically present in school the importance of in-person learning is well documented and there is already evidence of the negative impacts on children because of school closures in the spring of 2020. So that coupled with our parent survey and then the governor on July 2nd said, we know that each school system and perhaps each school building will likely look different in the fall. We also know that Ohio has a long history of local control and that school administrators and teachers know their schools best. So working together and consulting with educators and other health officials, we have developed a set of guidelines backed by science that each school should follow when developing the reopening plans. So with all this information, as a committee, we thought, well, we better get together and come up with a reopening plan that will work. The um, five guidelines that Governor DeWine gave us, gosh, I think it was just a week ago, so we certainly have been um, trying to put something together since his guidelines came out, is number one, that school districts vigilant, vigilantly assess for symptoms, including temperature checks. And that went right along with the results of our survey, because I believe our survey said 82% of our parents wanted the school to take temperatures every morning. You know, we certainly ask that parents check their children before they send them to school, but we know we need to do a second check when they come to school. So, that being said, we have ordered infrared thermometers for all of our homeroom teachers and principals so that we'll have 200 people taking temperatures every day. So this will be a quick process, a fast process. We're not going to have lines all over the place. We have infrared thermometers. And the good news is they're already here. So there's not a delay. Wash and sanitize hands. That was the second guideline from the governor. So we have ordered kiosks at every entrance full of hand sanitizer. We'll have hand sanitizer in the classroom. Also number three, clean and sanitized shared surfaces at school. We have disinfecting spray. Also scarlet and gray, our cleaning service has um, those electrostatic disinfecting uh, machines. And in addition, we have spoken to our cleaning service about having custodians here during the day to continually wipe surfaces and not just after hours. So we really need to look at changing our practice. Instead of after school, have them there during the school day. 
practice social distancing which we are working at in all of our classrooms. You know, unfortunately, the cooperative learning and sharing of materials that has just been so popular in recent years really can't occur next year. You know, desks need to be facing forward and students need to have their own individual materials as opposed to sharing materials. And the governor said face covering, there's a face covering policy required for all of our staff members and recommended for students in grade three and above. However, right before this meeting started, we heard that in Hamilton County, since we're a red um, county, I believe starting tomorrow evening, we all have to wear face coverings. So we do have a stock of masks and also face shields for staff and students, which actually are comfortable and you can see people, the teacher can see the children, the children can see the teacher. So I have put samples for everyone to keep at their desk. In fact, maybe I'll just keep this on and see if you can hear me with it on. <laughs> All right. Way to be a leader. Good job. All right. So we are, um, again, on the survey, 83% of our parents said they wanted the students, their children, in person in buildings daily, but with safety protocols. So we have two options, that option, but we also noticed on the survey between 10 and 17% of our parents said they weren't comfortable with that and would like the virtual option. So we're offering two options, one and two, the in-person and the virtual option. So I'm going to start with the option one, the uh, in-person one. Obviously, all staff must wear face coverings, a mask or a shield, and do daily temperature checks. And of course, um, the second um, line where Governor DeWine, DeWine recommended students in grade three and above wear a face covering, that may have changed to being mandatory at this point in time, or at least until Hamilton County moves out of the red zone. But things change daily, so all we can do is keep adjusting our protocols as we get different guidance from the various um, governor's office and, and health uh, services. Teachers are to take all student temperatures with the infrared thermometer as they enter classrooms. If it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit or above, the student will be quarantined. So now in addition to the nurse's office, we have to have a separate area because you really wouldn't want a child who maybe has a bloody nose or something sitting right next to the child who has a, a fever. So we'll have a special quarantine area in each of the buildings. And of course, we're going to call the parent right away to come and take the child home. Desks will be set up in order to socially distance, as I said earlier, no shared materials. And we're going to leave classroom doors open because you want to maximize airflow and you don't want every child touching the door handles. So there's all kinds of little things you can do like that that eliminate everyone touching the same surface. All right drop off and pick up for visitors. As you can see, our group of 50 people divided up into various areas and each team took a different um, area to work on. Obviously, we'll have designated entrances and exits. We're asking parents to limit your visits, go right to the school office. You know, we don't want socializing in the hallways. And it's, you, I feel horrible saying that because you want to welcome parents into a building and now we're in a position where, ooh, not so much until the pandemic is over because it's just an, uh, other individuals coming into the building who either could become ill or could spread illness. Uh, follow posted guidelines. We have ordered the posters. You know the sign is you see in retail establishments with stickers on the floor. Here's what six foot of distancing looks like. We have ordered all of that. Again, hand sanitizer kiosk at the entrances. Um, we're not going to have students sit in large areas, hundreds of ch children in a cafeteria. We're going to direct students to their classroom upon uh, arrival and take temperatures. 
Now this is really an oh, these um, bullet points are an overview of the plan, which is much more detailed. But I know you did not want me talking for an hour and reading each and everything. So what we did is took the main ideas out of the plan, page by page, if anyone wants to follow along on the plan. Hallways, lockers, and common areas. You know, we'll have to have a schedule. You don't want to let 100 children right next to one another out using their lockers. We um, are suggesting uh, students carry water bottles because we're going to have to talk to uh, Mr. Peter about our water fountains. Can they be changed into the ones that you can refill water uh, bottles? And we'll just have to look at all of that. Or should they just be turned off completely? So those are some of the things we still need to follow up on because this is, um, we're still six weeks weeks out and we're just um, still developing the plan and putting the you know, so tweaking the plan. Hey Mary. Yes. Um, with the additional use of water bottles for the classroom it would be wonderful if we could get everybody using reusable but in in the meantime is it something we can consider to also add additional recycling bins around the building for students that may not have access to a reusable bottle. Oh um, great so idea. So that way we have some receptacles recycle to appropriately the recycle. Plastic bottles? Correct. Great. Sure. Thank you. And um, hand sanitizer and washing statements provided. Lunch, we are still working through lunch. You know, we don't want to send hundreds of students to the lunchroom at one time. So some classes will eat in their classroom. Um, others, um, we're hoping to expand, for instance, the patio here at the high school, put more tables out there, spread upstairs up the steps to spread people out. Weather permitting, youngsters could sit out on the steps of the school anything to provide that social distance. Tabletops will be disinfected during lunch period. And uh, we're also looking at some outdoor classrooms like stools and a table where you could take a class outside, have them sit down and do more outdoor lessons, at least in the nice weather to provide that distance. So people had all kinds of really, really creative ideas. Um, in terms of health services, it's very timely that we're getting a student-based health center starting in January of 2021. Uh, staff with a full-time nurse practitioner from Center Point Health. But um, it's unfortunate they can't start right in August, but they did say telehealth services will be available in the fall prior to the health center opening. So if we had a need of that, we could use their telehealth services. Um, I did talk to Nurse Strasser who said nurses and health aides will be in full protective gear just because they're going to be dealing if there's a child who is sick. So I didn't want people to panic when they see that. Obviously any student displaying symptoms of COVID-19 will be isolated from others in a quarantine room. And the Norwood Health Department will be contacted and we will follow their directives for contact tracing and follow-up procedures. So that's really all I'm going to say about the plan. We actually had to take the Hamilton County Education and Service Center 56 page plan. Then there's the governor's 36 page plan, which you know you can't pass all of this out to every individual. It is too much to read. So we tried to condense it into our 12 page plan. And then of course I tried to condense it into 12 slides to keep us moving tonight. So I'm going to stop there, and if there aren't any questions, I'm gonna ask Shannon, our Director of Student Services, if she would talk about our virtual option, because that's option two. So option two is a virtual learning option. It is a $100 online option for students in kindergarten through 12th grade through a program called Edgenuity. So this is different from what was offered in the spring. This is completely online, it's not packets. Um, a team of our teachers and administrators explored several online programs and determined that Edgenuity is the best program um, for continued academic success for our students. It did come down to a few options, but Edgenuity was a standout because of its alignment to the state standards and ability for Norwood teachers to add in content. So we will have Norwood teachers that are assigned to monitor this program, add in content, and bring some of the work. Uh, Mary, do you want to go to the next slide and then we can play the demo? 
Sorry, at the bottom of that, it was the curriculum committee that um, reviewed all of the program options. So they spent many days over the past month or so um, participating in webinars to review the options. So we, we'll play a quick demo of uh, this is Edgenuity K-5. For families seeking a full-time virtual learning option for their elementary students, Edgenuity is proud to offer a virtual curriculum and instruction covering kindergarten through fifth grade. Edgenuity offers virtual students a full suite of more than 30 elementary courses, including electives like physical education, health, keyboarding, art, recorders, and scratch coding. Each course includes a full year of standards-aligned, research-based content with lessons logically organized in modules. If necessary, Edgenuity also provides a highly qualified state-certified teacher to work with families every step of the way. Students are introduced to new concepts and get an ample opportunity to practice new skills through text, video, and interactives. Previously learned concepts are reviewed throughout the year to strengthen the student's understanding. Videos are used to support the understanding of new concepts throughout the course. And then interactives allow students to practice newly learned concepts and receive immediate feedback. Worksheets are included as another method of practicing each concept throughout the year. Each worksheet is provided as a PDF or is available in a workbook for an additional cost. Students will scan or photograph these worksheets to submit to the teacher. Lessons include three quizzes to check understanding, and each module has a summative assessment. Students may also be assessed through benchmark assessments, synchronous live sessions with the teacher, or hands-on projects. A list of materials is provided for each lesson and for each course. Students are expected to have typical school supplies for most courses, but other materials may be needed for some lessons, especially in science. English language arts courses offer a balanced literacy program, including instruction in reading, writing, fluency, vocabulary, grammar, and other important elements of language. Students will have legally independent reading assignments, including novel studies in the upper grades. The learning coach will receive guidance to help students to choose and procure these books. To practice fluency skills, students will have opportunities to record audio and read aloud with the teacher during live synchronous sessions. Math courses build a foundation for mathematical thinking as students learn about numbers, counting, measurement, geometry, operations, and algebraic thinking. Using plenty of interactive tools, hands-on activities, and real-world examples, Science courses provide a rich multimedia experience for students using a mixture of exploring the world around them, combined with hands-on experiences or labs using nature or common household items. In social studies courses, students learn more about the world by exploring the community around them, studying the history of the United States and other countries, and experiencing cultures from around the world. While learning, students have access to a variety of on-demand support tools, including an on-screen reader, translator, dictionary, picture dictionary, and screen maps. Courses require the support of a learning coach, a parent, grandparent, or other designated adult. The learning coach may guide the student through lessons, discuss what's being taught, facilitate hands-on learning, and communicate with the teacher. The resources for each course include guidelines for the learning coach to facilitate learning, including how to schedule the day, set up a learning space, and submit assignments. Each lesson has a learning coach 
you heard about the option for workbooks or the downloadable PDF, we are purchasing the workbooks for students that choose this option. So we, they wouldn't have to have a printer or um, anything like that. It would be, the workbooks would be available to them. They mentioned the high quality virtual instructors. Those are instructors within the Edgenuity program. In addition to that, we will have our, our own Norwood teachers overseeing the program. So most of the instruction comes from the virtual instructor, but there will be contact with by our Norwood teachers as well. And Shannon, I think they just mentioned the K-5 to program. We're purchasing the K-12. to It's just we didn't want to show a second video for five minutes. So it is a K-12 to program. And many of the other districts in Hamilton County have also chosen Edgenuity because now we're getting group pricing through the Hamilton County Education Service Center because most districts landed on this as the best program out there. And the nice part of students move from one school district to another, it would be nice not to have to change programs. And you know, we do have children who move. Yes. Ian. Would we be able to post links to both of those videos on our website and on our Facebook page so if parents have older children, they can definitely watch that Great second idea. video. And maybe see it, uh, it's a little difficult to see here, but I want parents to be able to see these materials and review them. And they mentioned the learning coach. The learning coach would be a parent or grandparent or babysitter, whomever the child may be with. Um, we encourage uh, the family to be on a schedule, but the nice part of this is they don't have to be. They can do this whenever they have time. And there's vid there's uh, videos we can post as well to show like, it keeps the parent aware of how on track or not on track the child is with the program. So they can log in and, and see. Um, the last thing is that we will have to ask families to commit to one semester. So if they choose this option going in in August, they will have to stick with that option until um, the semester ends in January. And that's just for grading and staffing purposes, especially as the, the students get older, it's harder to switch over with credits and things midway through the year. So if a student has to leave the standard model to go home to online learning, how does that grading work in reverse? So if the student is in person and they have to go online, if it's for an extended period of time, we can look at, um, they, they had said the teacher can tweak the lessons. Um, so we can look at that. But if the, it's the whole class that has to go online, we will do what we did similar to March through May. Packet pickup or packets online, um, teacher, um, Google Meets, Google Meet, yeah. but so not I through Edgenuity. Separate, too. separate programming. Okay. If you have a kid and they get sick and they have to stay home or the family has to quarantine, can they do this? Or you just said they have to sign up at the beginning of the semester. You can't do any switching back and forth. Or if they do end up having to stay home or quarantine their whole family. Is there some other, other like, send home work? Or? Yes, that's what we'll do. If it's only for the two week period, the 10 days, it's very difficult to move into this program, then move back out. So At there's that, not a lot of flexibility to go back and forth, but you have other. Well, things. it's only because the program might be at a different place than the teacher is and if you're only they going to be out for two weeks months. we'd like the teacher to send work home just right now let's say a child falls breaks their leg they're out for two weeks before they can get crutches and come back and after surgery we send work home or teacher communication because but if it was but your points well taken if it was for a month or two then we would certainly look at moving into this program and the reason why we're saying a semester we can't have a parent two weeks in class and trying to get on this program for two weeks plus you do your staffing based on how many are in your virtual and how many are in your classroom and now if we've got massive numbers of students moving back and forth that's very difficult to manage so we're saying just stay for the semester and then you could switch back at winter recess if you want to come back in person and one of the things that that committee is working on, and other teachers will be involved as well, is to help align our pacing guides with edgenuity. And so that if when the other, when students return in January, they had not already learned everything through edgenuity if they return in person, or vice versa. Then my other question was, 
Is this being paid for like the CARES Act money? Yes. This counts for that? That's good. Yes, we are I'm able like, to pay. How is everybody paying for this whole new curriculum? It's because the CARES Act money we receive is very restrictive. You cannot pay for staffing. You basically, which is wonderful, you can pay for the thermometers, the sanitizers, the masks, the face shields, the cleaning supplies, and also this virtual program because the pandemic has caused you to have to go virtual. So we're very fortunate that we can purchase this. But like I said, Hamilton County districts have all banded together and it's a group buy out of the Hamilton County Education Service Center. Now, we do have to figure out how many of our families want the in-person versus the remote learning option. So we are going to be doing another survey or a form or a questionnaire, whatever you want to call it, in the next week or so where we're going to ask you your child's name, the grade, which do you want so that we'll have a feel for, you know, our survey said, you know, 83% one in person. So somewhere between 10 and 17% of our parents were interested in the uh, virtual. So we'll have to see how that plays out, who they are, what grade level they're at, so we can sort out staffing. Do we know yet if, uh, if we choose virtual, are there opportunities to, no, so over the spring, we could come and pick up a lunch and we got that interaction or we needed to pick up a packet or whatever. And I just felt that was so great that my kids got to see some teachers, maybe the principal, and sometimes their teachers made special appearances or gave them awards or whatever. Are they still going to have those opportunities to connect? I know a lot of people are afraid of the um, online, like they, they are scared of going to school, but they're also scared of online because there's no connection, they don't want it. They, they don't see people, well, so they'll have a Norwood you yeah you'll have a Norwood teacher assigned as the teacher of record who will issue the report card who will communicate with the family but we just wanted to make sure that families know it's more independent than it was in March and April like we're the, talking about can we set up some type of interaction event for our online students so if we only have 10% of our students who decide to do a fully online program. Can we as a group implement some type of like maybe once a week we have an online student meetup where they come and maybe it's in the evening and they take over the gym to talk to teachers and ask questions. Something like sure. that maybe. Um, and the teachers could rotate based on their schedule. I don't want to promise our teachers anything outside of their scheduling. but. That way, the students have an opportunity to still have some social component. Our parents are very concerned about losing that social component, but they might really need the online option for safety. Oh, so okay. I think it's crucial that we build something, and even if it's not weekly, if it's every other week, some type of check-in, some type of face-to-face -face where they can distance, and they wouldn't necessarily be interacting with the other students, because we don't want to bring in a second round of potential carriers and expose them to kids who are isolated. We weren't. All, we just. Right. You almost were just one family at a time picking up the lunch. You didn't uh, interact with other families yeah. very much. Sometimes there'd be a family or two there. And is there a lunch pickup or a lunch schedule oh. that will be in place for those families? If families wish to, yes, we would certainly do that. But we'd have to arrange a certain time because, like you said, you don't want them suddenly in the middle of the cafeteria picking up a lunch or wherever. But certainly we can work that. So we can that. still set up, like here, for example. Exactly. And have a line that parents can only come in right to this door and pick up lunch. And pick up, a, yep, the grab-and-go lunch that we've been doing. That would not be a problem. But I do like your idea. I think it's nice that they can meet with the teacher and the teacher would be there and parents could come in. Everybody had left. Okay. Here's 15 minutes. Let me answer any questions. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I don't know how it might look yet, but that would be something I think some of the parents would be. And you and still as children feeling about <laughs> still have a right to be involved in all the extracurriculars. I just don't know if they'd be comfortable or not. But that. <laughs> but. <laughs> that was another question. How do the oh. home home online students participate in sports or music? They, they have. They can. They're allowed, oh, certainly. All of those opportunities are open to them. Um, does that apply for a student who's like, if so band would be a class. So would those students then have to be on campus for band and then leave? Most probably 
And is that okay? So online students, because I do have an orchestra child who's going in the seventh grade, so she'll have the real orchestra class. So she comes in just during orchestra. She's, I, I believe we could work through that. You know, this is this, you know, we're only a couple weeks in and this is a scheduling nightmare. In fact, I was meeting with the high school principal today just trying to figure out how we could arrange that. It would be nice if band were maybe last bell of the day, but I can't guarantee it because I don't have the high school uh, master schedule in front of me so that you could just come at the end of the day and that's when the class would be. But yes, we want to make sure that all those parents know that you can participate in all the extracurriculars or come in and leave. Yes, that would be an option. I'll get her there at any time you want. Perfect. So Mary, you mentioned that the survey is going to come out next week for preferences. Well, I don't know if it's a survey, maybe a questionnaire. But back to school is still six weeks away. So is there, a lot can change in six weeks as we've seen. So is there kind of a hard cut off? I mean, maybe, maybe I'm comfortable with coming back to school now, but in six weeks I'm not. How, how does that work? What kind of flexibility is there? I would say uh, maybe a week out before school starts, we really need to know because you're having to shift personnel. Yes. So you can see we might have to move a teacher out of an in-person class and into the virtual or vice versa. And that is a problem as you're trying to scramble and assigning a teacher so they know what grade level they're going to be teaching and what. It, could it's, we do maybe the first survey if you could answer it within a week and then that kind of gives us an idea yeah. of what people are thinking and then maybe another one comes out yeah. forward. I know a couple of districts. A couple of districts are expecting their final decisions due by August 17th, which would be a week before. Our That's about that be about a week out. For because you because you really do have to say to the teacher now who was planning on teaching third grade is now teaching something else online when they were going to be in person or the other way around. So they do need that week to prepare. Yeah. So we will try to be as flexible as possible, but your point's well taken. Yeah, I think a week is totally reasonable. I don't think six weeks is reasonable at this point. Yeah, yeah but we just, yeah, we'd like an initial blush of, of yeah. who's going where. Yeah. But you're right, the ground is shifting every day. It's changing every day. It's just been so hard, and now we're doing two school starts, an in-person one, a remote one, and then switching. It, it's a very interesting year. Now, I've also seen, like, parents with multiple children, they're not limited to picking for their entire household so if they feel that their high schooler is perfectly capable of staying online perfect uh, while they're at work but their smaller child might need that in person at school all day they can choose one option for one student oh, in their sure. home and one option for the other student. That's what the question here will be. Here's all your children. Tell us if you want in person, online. We need to know the grade level so we have an idea to plan. Great. So we're hoping that everyone will see that. That'll come out in the next week or so. So I was um, doing my registration for my children and the, for my seventh grader. It said on the registration, do I want in person or online? Is that this online or is it Actually, it is. I, we talked to uh, Kimberly, who does our final forms. And oh, Alice, you are where you're the parent we just love because you have already. I know it's late. No, no, you've got on the final forms and you've updated your information because that's what we're concerned about. If your phone number or your address or your email is changed, we're concerned that we're not going to be able to communicate with you. So this is the yearly. Would you please update your information? And we did ask, would you check? off are you interested but I'm also I just know that not everyone has done that so I figure a, a questionnaire that we can send out and if people don't get back with us obviously we're going to have to the school secretary's call to try to hunt down everybody to make sure that we've put you in the right place and what you want but thank you for doing that on final forms that is kind of a confirmation I didn't fill it all the way out so I was like oh no what is this but thank but you yeah because it's just crucial these days that we have up-to-date contact information because I mean every week we're sending something out. Mary are you able to discuss the reason we are not putting a two day off two schedule together because I know a lot of parents are curious they thought we would do a blended model well is there a reason yes. that we as Norwood are are potentially not 
putting that up as an option? I believe right now that in Hamilton County, out of the 23 districts, Cincinnati Public is probably the only district that's doing a blended model. Early on, we all thought that was the direction that we were being given from the state. And then suddenly, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out and said, children need to be in school full time. And then the governor said that. So I believe at this time, we will be in step with all the other districts in Hamilton County, also the but surrounding Butler and Warren counties. I'd say in Ohio, probably 95% of the school districts will be back in person five days a week. It's just very difficult for some large districts with all the transportation issues and everything to manage that so you can see why they're trying to blend it model. If you had asked me that question back in May, I would have said it's we're going to be virtual or blend it. And then as June came, all of a sudden, as you see, the dates on these, as we got to the end of June, it shifted and suddenly the message is back in person. That's what everyone's advising. Of course, I'm also keenly aware as all this approaches, the guidance could change and it could be back to virtual. Well, the good news is we will have this Edgenuity platform that would be if, let's say, we did suddenly have to go virtual. We do have this as the infrastructure because I know um, parents found it difficult. Different teachers were using between Google Teams, they were using Zoom, they were using all kinds of different platforms. If you had three children, you were looking in three different places. This would at least give us the structure and we'd work with teachers to put more of their material in this if we were forced to do this for three or four or five months. So we're trying to have um, the tools necessary if things were to change because it just seems like we're having to pivot on a dime these days. But I think you will see in the state of Ohio most districts are going to be back five days a week in person. But like I said, if you asked me that in May, I would have bet, oh no, absolutely not. But now here we are with the governor and the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics saying children need to be in school. So I'm curious, um, it's obviously one of the guidelines that Governor Wine said was about social distancing. I'm having a really hard time picturing my kids' classrooms and how we can fit 20 desks and kids in a class and have them spaced appropriately. And I, I know a few will be out because of um, exactly. the online option, but I mean, I think 10%, that's two kids in a class, and I don't think that makes sense. A huge um, you're right. If you read the guidance these days, it is a um, minimum of three feet. Six feet is, is aspirational, and I think that's why they've gone to mandating masks or face mm -hmm. coverings, because they realize that we will be closer. Have than we like, gone in feet. classrooms and like <laughs> actually physically <laughs> measured that out? Because even three feet, I think, seems... We, um, have, we have checked up, Joe Westendorf did, at Sharpsburg and said he could fit 19 or 20, and that was back when it was six feet. We're fortunate that we kept the older buildings that seem to have bigger classrooms and a lot of renovated buildings day, these days. They've gone to the minimum size, and with these old buildings, that has been great. I think we'll have to look at a different arrangement, you know, desk all facing in one way, and we'll probably, if there's computers in the back of the room, we'll do some plexiglass shields between them, because in that, case they might be closer so we'll probably look at plexiglass and we've ordered those kind of shields I'm sorry to mean to cut you off for like our speech therapist and everything too because if you're working face to face and you're having to talk to a child and this is how you make the sounds and move your mouth obviously we're going to have plexiglass barriers so I know Alice has a question and then I have a question that I want to ask so mine was basically the same as Sally's I did have a parent ask how many students will be in a classroom it depends. It just depends. Yeah, I can't she say that. In especially in the lower grades, she's extremely worried about small children wearing masks, and she wants them to. Um, she doesn't want to send her kid if they're not wearing masks. Um, and then I thought of another one while you were talking, but I lost it. That's all right. We, we you go. It'll come back. back. All right. So uh, we've talked a lot about elementary school. We've talked a little bit about high school. So what's the plan specifically for preschool? So preschool is also governed by Hamilton County Job and Family Services regulations, and similar to the child care centers in 
in Ohio as well. So currently, um, it is a nine. Nine kids per class. Limit. Nine okay. students per class. Wow. Luckily, preschool does not start until the first week in September, so we have a little bit of time, and I will remain hopeful that maybe we can have a little bit more. But if that is the case, we will have to look at a two-day a week option. So we will look at Monday, Tuesday for one class, and then a um, Wednesday is like our cleaning day, because as you know, preschoolers, are there's tons of little toys and manipulatives that they're playing with, so we will spend Wednesday cleaning before the other class comes in on Thursday and Friday. Shannon, have we looked at our numbers? Do you think a lot of parents would opt out of preschool? So we have not surveyed our parents about that since May. Um, when we did, when Glenna made phone calls to parents in May, they were optimistic about coming back. Um, we did not, maybe had a couple of families that said, no thank you, or we're gonna have to look into a different option for next year. But as far as we know, Everyone is still coming back, but we are, our maximum class size is 16, so we can divide them up. It would be 8 and 8. So if you do an AB group, we, we have plenty of space for everybody that's planning on coming yeah. back. Yeah, and our, our preschool rooms are pretty large. Yeah. Um, so. Because right now they go four days a week, right? So Thank we'd you. be dropping from four days to two days. So it's Monday, currently it's Monday through Thursday with Fridays off, but we would have to, I think that Wednesday option to deep clean is really important. So why couldn't we still do four days? We just put Wednesday in the middle instead of Friday. That way the kids can go four. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Um, I did have a question, and this is probably gonna be for you, and that preschool discussion brought it back to me. Um, I'll mention this first. So, with the fact that we have the Sharpsburg Primary Building, um, could it be an option that we put all of our idiots biddies in that building? And that way, they because they are the most likely to touch things, and they would need the, the highest level of sanitation and, and cleanliness procedures, what if, what if we considered an option where we took all of the district preschool and maybe kindergarten and put them into that one building on a 2-2 model? So that way they would be, it would be easier to maintain that one building and isolate should we need to versus keeping them at separate buildings. I think Does that make that sense? That is transportation because then we would have to provide transportation to students that live more than two miles away. And with neighborhood schools, we don't have that issue because everybody can walk. So once we move, I just figured with you already having to transport down here to the middle school. Um, you is exactly like 1.9 miles from this right. house to, to here. Yeah. Um, Shanna, what about licensing issues? Because licensing. preschool rooms are licensed too by Jobs and Family yeah. Services, and yeah. that's preschool huge. Rooms. I can't even move the class next door without <laughs> going through an entire process that literally takes months. So when you move out to the modulars and then back, and then next year if I move a classroom, it's okay. a long process. That helps a lot. Yeah. Um, my other question that's probably still going to be for you, um, we've been asked specifically what are we, what is our policy going to be when it looks at IEP students, special needs students, kids that cannot wear masks in a standard classroom, um, are we going to be able to maybe have those kids in in a special class that is separate where those children may not be required to have a face mask on and that way they can be socially distanced in their own group without masks? Uh, like how, how will that look for our IEP students and parents concerned about IEP? So no student is required to wear a mask. Staff are required to wear a mask. Um, no students are required. It's just highly recommended for, for 3 to 12. Okay. Um, students with disabilities or um, health issues do not have to wear a mask. They are exempt from any of the, the mask recommendations. As far as um, our students with disabilities can also choose the ingenuity option and we would provide um, their services based on their IEP goals either virtually like we did March to May or um, we will have like an isolation room here, a separate room um, where we would have an intervention specialist and the student could come in and work in a small group or one-on-one. -on -one. Intervention specialist, speech therapist, any of the therapists. Okay. Um, and then we will also try to work with our with our team to try to limit the um, 
adults, like going into classrooms currently, they're pushing in for a lot of services, so making sure we're really targeting groups of students and making sure that the adults are working with the same students every day, so they're not working with new. So aides get assigned more one-on-one -on -one or small group, and they just kind of stay with that group. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I um, am curious if you can speak to uh, what happens if a staff member or a student has a positive COVID test um, and kind of what the process will be if you even have this plan yet. I just mess up in the works. But. No, we would immediately call the Norwood Health Department and the contact tracing starts. Uh, we have had two meetings with them because we assisted with the situation last week where we helped make some of the calls or we need emailed out the um, letter from the health department to the families involved as opposed to them trying to do it in u.s mail that takes days to get there so we'll have to work really really closely with the health department but one of the things i, I would like to ask the board your opinion on is you know if we have a child test positive and they are out and then when they come to return i I know that you know we've all been told 72 hours symptom free that but with other illnesses we do ask for a doctor's note or the health department release and I want it was uh, that was the direction we were looking at going in after consulting with nurse Strasser that we would like some kind of documentation when a child returns after having tested positive and being out for two or three weeks before they come back that the doctor releases and where the health department says it's over so we were looking at that but that is a bit more stringent than what's out there medically but it's in line with what happens in general in schools when you're out with even if it's a, a rash or whatever it is we do like a doctor's note before you come back just because we don't know if you're still contagious or so if there's issues. Out of, out of a concern for safety for everybody, students, staff, everybody in the district, my preference would be would if somebody did test positive and have to go out and heal and come back, I would want to make sure as a district we are for sure getting something from a medical professional that says that that person, that student, that staff member, whoever, is able to come back and either learn or perform their duties. So either a proof of negative test, if it's other class members, maybe they weren't exposed. Proof of negative test, are we going to be able to integrate those students into another classroom? Is there, like maybe, let's say the teacher is sick and the students test negative. How do we educate those? Are we bring in a sub like a standard classroom, or that's a and possibility. They can be in sight? But chances are, if it's at an elementary classroom, it's the teacher and the 20 students are probably all going to be quarantined for the two weeks. Right. So we would require a proof of a negative test from everybody in quarantine, correct? Or at least the doctors know, or the, doctors or doctors the know. health department saying that they're eligible to come back. So proof of a negative test, doctors know or a um, statement from the health department pretty much saying this the same thing. You're saying for somebody who's exposed or somebody who had already tested positive? Well, if, if, let's say first grade class. Well, no, that is a good question because there's a difference. Right. We just sent them home in quarantine for two weeks, but you never tested positive. Many people get quarantined for two weeks but don't even get tested because... Right. Right. So if if they go get tested and have a negative test, I think they would be allowed to come back. If they are you saying not somebody who's tested. been exposed or somebody who has been ill? I was saying someone who had tested positive. Right, that's what, that's I thought, what I'm saying. It sounded like you're talking about somebody who's been exposed. Which would be 20. I mean, it could be a whole class. Well, that's my concern is if you have a student. So say it's it's a fifth grade student who also has multiple teachers and all the, all of your fifth grade teachers are exposed and have to be quarantined for two weeks, like. So then instruction would move on, because then the whole fifth grade would be quarantined. So one positive student can shut down an entire grade? Well, we're trying not to let that happen because you're supposed to, you know, be within six feet for 10 to 15 minutes. And so we're trying to say to teachers, let's not be on top of students. If you're in front of the class, you're wearing a mask and a face shield. Students have masks on. 
chances are and we're also trying to limit the movement in buildings so that we wouldn't take out a whole grade level hopefully would just be the classroom so I think actually the Hamlin County Health Department said if a child tests positive they were talking about a six-foot halo around the child but I think practically I mean when you think about it it's probably have to be the whole class because children do move around so I just don't know how you can do a six foot around but so are we are classes staying together or and teachers will we be are, moving we are not having the teachers well we've discussed that because that's varies, less, that's varies, less exposure it varies by building you know right away at the high school there's issues because now they're not in their science class but at the elementary we're doing more of that and also trying to keep students together all day at 7 8 and possibly 9 and 10 so that you're not just doing the whole grade level and exposing them and so we are looking at some block scheduling so basically we're redoing our schedule that's been done trying to accommodate this but I know it's so that's something else that I was gonna ask about is if it would be feasible to and I realize this is would be very late in the game to change the schedule this way but to do any kind of block scheduling for the high school and the middle school because then you're having four class your teachers are only being exposed to exactly four groups of students versus you know, seven. versus seven and that's what in fact uh, principal acres and principal miller were meeting today trying to figure out what kind of block scheduling they could do just to cut down on that because you're safest if you stay with the same group and right. not interact with 120 other people a day you're just a lot safer so we are looking at redoing schedules but sometimes like when you get to 11th and 12th grade in all honesty that's probably not as feasible just because you've got 10 advanced placement classes you got you know college credit plus so you've got more singleton classes so there'll be more movement but yes we are looking at it seven eight nine and ten I, I know in the beginning you had mentioned you know if you were asked what direction you'd be going um, six weeks ago you would have said blended learning right two one or, vir or, or virtual or virtual I really didn't think in May we'd be coming back and all of a sudden the tide changed right in, in talking about this issue with scheduling I don't know how block scheduling would look on an AB that's what we did when we, when we were here. Yeah, we had a four schedule per day block schedule. No, no, no. Right, but no, he's but, saying but the two day a week. On, on oh, a two day a oh, week. Oh, on the two day. No, oh, no, they're yeah, not. I'm, it I'm, wouldn't. They're not talking on an eight. They're just talking during the day. So instead during, of no, but I, I know seven in the beginning, classes. In the beginning, yeah. we were looking at yeah. blended learning. Mm -hmm. Right. right. It, it wouldn't would, work. Like like an A B schedule. And as we're talking through this, you know, this the scheduling fiasco. In my mind, I'm thinking back to that. You know, two day. Two day in school, two day out, or three day out, you know, whatever. And I don't see, I don't see how scheduling works. I can't, I can't picture it in my mind. And there, there's no other option at that point but to do, try to go back five days. And you have the same exposure even being here two or three days a week because if someone's positive. You're, and to clarify, you can still get a block scheduling, if parents aren't familiar with it, when, when Sally and I were both here, we had a block schedule that was four classes per day. So your your exposure went from two days a week at seven full bells yes. rotating around the building, but now you're here five days a week, but you're only in four classrooms. And that's it. So four classrooms per day. So it definitely impacts the amount of people you would be around every day. And it's block scheduling worked great for the amount of learning time per day dedicated to one subject. That is the discussion that was occurring today to see if we could do something like that. Isn't that what we do in college too? So we have semester Tuesday, block. Thursday or your Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes. So if we only, not that you're doing it, but if we went back to the two days a week, you'd have your Monday classes and your Tuesday classes and then but, but, you'd have but, all your classes and then you do the rest online. Right, but then, then there, I mean, you know, we have all of these graduation requirements that have to be met. So you couldn't possibly do that and still be able to meet, in my mind, you know, just just so the rest, thinking about the rest of the week you're doing online work, which in high school, I mean, I thought this, doing your own work all the time. Yeah, I thought the College Credit Plus program offered an online component. No, I'm not talking about college. I, but yeah, I am cur I'm curious about that. Yeah. Do we have online availability for our seniors that might be doing College Credit Plus programming? Is there an online component for them? I'm not sure. We'd have to talk since we um, 
you have to talk to the college with whom you have your college credit plus program. Okay. Right now they credential the teacher that follows the same curriculum as they're teaching at the college or university. So I, I don't know the answer to I that. We'd have to ask. So, since the universities have online options, especially for this fall, I would hope so. So in, in the plan, we're just doing the one wellness check at the beginning of the day. If you would like it after lunch, we could certainly do it also. I mean, I think we it's probably not a bad idea, especially since everyone has an infrared thermometer and it is quick and easy to do. Right. Because you're right, if... Um, Eat yeah. lunch, everybody get their temperature. Mm -hmm. Right. As they, as they come back after lunch into a class, after I think they get that's... all hot from recess. Let's take your temperature. Uh, well, I went to Kings Island and I stood in line to get in and, um, and we're all spaced out. That part was good. I didn't like being inside. We didn't stay very long when we left and I'm never going back until this is over. But they did that. They pointed that thing at my forehead and it said 99.5 and I said, oh my goodness, what does that mean? He says, you don't have a fever. I You've said, just is it because I've been standing out in the sun? He says, yes. Yeah. And I was like, yes. oh, yeah. wow. So we won't do it when we come in from recess, because that probably would give us a false reading. <laughs> right? They'll but after very, we, very hot. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, thank so you. So the other thing I was going to say was, I watched that CPS um, board meeting. It was like the highlight of my week that week. It was so interesting. And I told everyone in the house, be quiet, CPS board meeting. And I remember them saying the reason they picked the two day a week, well, two, three, and switch the blended, um, was because they had read those uh, pediatric report and, and the other one saying about the three feet, and, and they were very, they did not, uh, they were not confident in the three feet thing. And that they said, they were all saying, I'm voting the two, three week because I need those kids to be six feet apart. Um, are we confident? I just want to be reassured, I guess, that we are absolutely confident that we can space those kids out. Yes, I think we feel as comfortable as any district can. And like I said, I think CPS might be reassessing that decision oh, yeah. just because, because of the the hardship it is on families who have to work and who don't have you know there's not a stay-at-home mom so I and it was a four to three vote and I think you know I know we've had some calls about if you know we take students from other districts because parents are out there right now are shopping and of course we are not an open enrollment district so no we don't but I think parents are calling around looking for options just because they're and desperate private school parents. yeah they are all us private school parents yeah they are desperate that for like options a really nice program. is CPS not offering an online option the way we are they are. Or are they out there? They, they are, but they're trying, unfortunately, you know, it's it's lovely here because everyone has a Chromebook and that isn't the case in oftentimes bigger districts because you're having to buy 35 or 36,000 of everything. That's what's so nice here. I could easily buy 200 thermometers and a couple thousand face shields because it's a reasonable number. But when those numbers are like that, it's very, very difficult. But um, I think we'll, we'll see, and this plan may well change. You know, this is just the beginning of July. We have another six weeks, and we'll have to keep tweaking it based on what keeps coming out of Columbus, out of Hamilton County, out of the Norwood Health Department. It just feels like every day you have to look and see. I think that's an important statement that you just made, um, is that this plan, even though this is something that we're discussing, we're going to tweak, we're going to vote on so that way the district has direction. This is a living document. This is something that is going to change depending on whatever happens in the future. So if we need to tweak this plan and modify this plan, you know, maybe we find out, you know, we get two or three weeks into this and this doesn't work, right? So we need to be flexible enough to be able to, to realize that quickly and be able to make a change if we need to. Exactly. But 
but as a body and to give our staff and our families and our students some direction you know we, we can't sit on this forever and you know I was hoping that the governor would have made his announcement earlier than what he did I think he put it off three times right which you know cut into the timeline that we have potentially for this so you know I encourage still to ask some more questions but I'm kind of relaying kind of where my head is at with this so that we can think about what's next and, and where my head is at with this is you know we're meeting now on July 7th our board meeting isn't until July 24th where we actually take a vote on this I do want to have some time for our staff to review this and, and provide some input. I want to have some time for our families to review this and have some input. But where my head is at with this, you know, we're not giving, we're not getting from the administration, you know, an a la carte. You're either doing choose plan A, choose plan B, or choose plan C. It's here's the plan that that we've all spent months trying to put together and, and collectively with a lot of public schools in Hamilton County, this is where we think the direction should be. Here's the plan we're presenting in front of you just to give direction. I want to have a very short review time from staff, families, and, and everybody, but I would really like to entertain holding a special meeting quickly. So we normally host our board meeting on the third Thursday of the month. So for folks looking for that meeting to be next week on the 16th, we have given an extra week of cushion to be able to put out the well, survey and to get it's some the feedback from it's still staff. The, it's still the 23rd. third Thursday. Yeah. No, it's the, it'll be the fourth Thursday, technically fourth. this month. Okay. Oh, only this month we backed it up an extra week. So that yeah. does buy us a tiny window of extra time. Not well, much, I understand. Well, I don't want to um, wait that long. Oh, I just mean I don't want families to t try to tune in next Thursday expecting a meeting and there not be one it, it got moved to the 23rd I want to make sure folks are aware of that meeting. right so so what I would like to entertain is, is is a short review period and then quickly coming back in a special meeting with only this item on our agenda what day uh, or what day is the survey being planned to send out because we want to give people time to fill it out like would we want to have responses due by the 20th that way we have a few days before our meeting I, I to, to be honest with you um, parents filling out the survey uh -huh. doesn't impact the, the whether or not what we do with this point because the survey is just whether or not they're going to send their kids to online or whether they're going to send their kids to five days at school, right? We have to vote on, on well, I thought whether their or not feedback was going to be plan. on there as to, you know, are they going, like our staffing needs are going to be involved there, um, whether or not we're going to be, if, if parents want things like lunch pickup or uh, be involved in sports or band, like things like that, we'll have to consider for that final. I want to give I want to give our administration time, I mean, because if we wait till the 24th, wait till the 24th. 23rd. Huh? 23rd. 23rd. 30. 23rd is 20, the Thursday. It's the 23rd, but I just want to make sure. Okay. <laughs> we all got it. 23rd. So if, if we do that, then, then we're giving we're giving the for the vote, then we're giving the district or staff basically like three weeks to figure everything out. And I don't want to do that. If I can give them an extra week, right? So if we can hold a special meeting a week earlier than our regular board meeting. Or if we can hold a special meeting so on regular, regular board night. Right. Or or even earlier than that. I mean, to be honest with you, if we get some good feedback really quickly and, and we can give proper notice, I mean, early next week I would be okay sitting down and, and you know, giving the district some direction with the understanding that this is a living plan. This is something that, you know, even though we're giving the district some direction and saying, okay, yes, we need to have a path to follow with the understanding that, you know, as situations change because, you know, we're six weeks out from school, right? So the world could be a totally different place in six weeks. But, but when is that feedback expected to be returned to us to be able to review? So what feedback are you waiting on? 
Just the feedback from the present from this presentation. The feedback from this presentation. Just parents from parents. Just parents. Survey. You know, or That's all I did all survey is completely different. Survey okay. survey is whether or not you want to choose online or whether you want to send your kids to school as normal. Well, right? Okay. That's completely See, I was hoping for some additional questions in there of what parents might need beyond that. What types of services might they be looking for? That way we have time to add it into the document. So I'd like to give them a week to look at that and think about, okay, for my third grader I need this, but for my 10th grader I really need this. Like, What are they looking at overall? So they can read this document, read other districts' documents. You know, maybe they have a cousin out in somewhere that has some really awesome plan that they can say, hey, this looks similar, but did you know they were doing this? And we would have the opportunity to then take that feedback and work it in or tweak as needed. So I think we need to give them a chance to have a voice and write I, something in. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. I just don't want to wait all the way to the end of July. No, I'm okay. That's why I was saying if we want to, if we put this survey out by Friday, we have to create it. Um, we would need to give them a few days to answer. It's it's just a questionnaire, right? It's just. It is, but when is it going out? I had said next week in the road That's call. I mean. so we, need we don't even have that plan. developed yet because we were getting the plan together so right. you know that, that's why i was saying if we give them that week if we put it out monday right. we get responses by friday we have a meeting on monday the 20th and that way it's four days before our board meeting we can have a special board meeting that night to discuss the responses so we can give families one full week to respond and then message us back with those okay I'm, I'm okay with that. How does everybody else feel about that? Is that realistic? Um, What's yeah. the plan? I was so up one of my parents' questions. Possibly having a special board meeting on the 20th. That's fine with me. And it, it, just to discuss this one item so we could, we could deliberate and vote on it. So, so, and the idea is to gather feedback before that meeting. gather feedback before that so okay. anybody that you know has an opinion about this plan good bad or ugly yeah. they can email us uh, email us email the district uh, board of ed at norwoodschools.org or our superintendent you know let's let, let's let's collect that you know and, and try and move forward with this my whole point of this is giving the district some direction as quickly as possible so that way we, we can path forward. No, I, I completely agree with that. That's that's awesome. I just want to make sure folks have time to to receive it, think about it, really do their research and, and answer yeah. without rushing through. I want to and our teachers and staff too for their input. Yeah. That's all I I know. I know. And some of the stuff that we're talking about maybe putting in the survey is mandated. What's so that? Some is mandated. Some is mandated. If a child needs lunch, we're going to provide lunch, whether they're virtual or, or, or not. Right. You know? So some of the stuff really doesn't need any further discussion. It's just, it's, it's just wheels in motion. We just have to put the wheels in motion to do it. Okay. In my, in my mind, I was thinking the questionnaire is asking, what would you, yes. what, what, are you, what are you choosing for next year? A, be, a, plan A or plan B, and then there could be a suggestion box or a That's what I was somebody contact me box or, you know, that kind of thing. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. That way if it's approved sooner, we can get that questionnaire out to families so we can begin phone calls so we don't get back. I will say I think obviously the parent survey we did was super helpful but it's been almost a month now and I feel like I think some people's opinions might change I mean I feel like I even feel differently than I did maybe a month ago just seeing that as things have reopened um, how cases have surged and stuff so I, I feel like it's good to kind of get some more feedback because I think even you know in a couple more weeks, like we said, everything changes day to day. So right. I, feel like I think that's why the governor waited too, because everything, every guideline has changed. Every week has been different. If we'd have come out with this plan a month ago, we would be sitting here changing it. 
Well, if we would have come out with this plan a month ago, we probably would have come out with a blended learning plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Or all virtual, exactly. And then we'd be backtracking and, you know, so I think giving it a cushion is not a bad thing right now. Yeah, and that's and that's why I make the caveat that, that this plan is a living document. Yeah. It, it will change, tweak, and be modified depending on whatever situation the district is in at that time. So. And then final, mm -hmm. final decisions would be due a week before school starts. Like parents deciding one or the other final decision would I be by the, the 17th or whatever that Monday was. So I think, I think don't we have to develop a resolution to get to the Board of Education or to the Department of Education and isn't there a deadline on that? Oh, that's the remote learning resolution, which I believe we have to have whatever plan we choose. We need that resolution, and Alice um, is presenting it tonight from House Bill 164. So that's true whether we're all virtual or whether we're okay. back or whether we're blended. We have to let them know that we are interested in remote learning. So that's so, yes. for the 20th, 23rd? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's by the 31st of July. Okay. okay. So we're presenting it tonight, either of the meetings we could, are you suggesting we vote on it on the 20th? No, I, I was just thinking that's one that had the deadline. Yes, that has a deadline at the end of July. All right, any other questions about our Black to School Plan? Good job on answering our very, very many questions. We're trying to be Thank flexible you. and you do too. something that works for everyone, but this is just a very different time. All right, so we're going to move on to the next presentation on our agenda, and that is the, the actual ingenuity contract. So I know we, we talked about that in the back to school plan, but this is the actual contract for the, uh, the remote learning um, system software. Who's presenting that? I can talk a little bit about that. I was so, going to say, do I think it is? The contract is, um, the quote for services is uh, for Hamilton County Educational Service Center. So because so many districts in Hamilton County did come to Edgenuity as the gateway option, the best option, we are able to get a reduced rate for um, each student. So the proposal that you see is for the minimum, and then you can always add on to it when we um, have an actual number of students that will be participating in, you know, in the virtual option. Okay. And again, that contract will be paid by the district. Yeah, there's no attachment in the agenda. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. So those links can go on to the website for parents to take a look at that material for both grade levels yeah I have one too but honestly it's as clear as mud because they're trying to do it by student and there's no total on it or anything because it is a group purchase you know one semester six courses three hundred ninety dollars per student it's just it's a I'll be glad to pass it around but I don't think um, do we know how we much of a discount we're getting from with with the with the group purchase don't we'll, we'll ask Hamilton County. So we'll have a, for the board meeting on the 23rd, we'll have a final price. But right now, it's just, they listed every possible option with a, a number next to it. Yeah, it, well. Uh, no, I know, I, yes. I you really can't figure out guess. what it is. <laughs> it sounds like, I don't know. Except that all the districts are looking at this particular program. So I was glad that our teachers and staff landed in the are same they place. I mean, now we know lots of teachers who have lost jobs. Should we tell them to look into that? Possibly, yeah. Right? I mean, you know, help them work. I mean, I know yeah. uh, some of our uh, parents in our district who are teachers who have lost jobs. Yeah. And like, and they keep saying, are you hired? And I'm like, no, no, we're not. <laughs> but now I'm telling them, go check so out this ingenuity. I do have a question on the, the program itself. Were they able to look at this like, through an equitable lens? Like, how are the programs in terms of state equity needs? Um, like, what is the program? Because I didn't get to review the curriculum, so. Like, yeah, that's not a part of that committee. Um, okay. Christina Johnson actually um, spearheaded that committee. But it is. 
it is ever changing, and so they are always updating the program. So, so we actually, yes, the company itself has that lens, and then that was also in the front of everybody's mind within that, within our own curriculum. So if our students in class, uh, I assume that the materials are supposed to try to be on par with what's being taught online, so the students aren't too far off in their learning process. If we suddenly have an outbreak and these students have to then move to an online model, I know we have the packets and things for temporary use, but if we suddenly have to, let's say the state changes and we have a full shutdown again, are, are we prepared to quickly move into a full-on ingenuity model? Like, are they equipped to support our entire district moving at once if so the state makes that happen? At, like, are we able to do similar to what we did last year and use this as a platform? Mm -hmm. We will have a learning management system, whether that's Google um, or another learning management system so that everything, it's a one-stop shop. If tomorrow everybody has to go virtual, from the classrooms, mm -hmm. there will be a, a platform that parents can log in and everything is right there. Okay. Um, assignments, schedules, everything. I just want to make sure they they are able to handle, if we have to suddenly move and throw everybody into that program, or again, if you've got one child at home on this program and one child in school, right. and suddenly you need both kids, are these two kids going to be on completely different programs temporarily, or? I think you know. it depends on the length of the show. Okay. It's going to be a learning experience for all of us next year. So I just wanted to repeat, because I think we do have a lot of parents watching us tonight, that the Edgenuity contract is paid for by the district out of CARES Act funding, mm -hmm. so there will be no cost to parents if they choose this virtual option. Thank you for letting us know that. So that, that that's important. I mean, you know, we did get a significant amount of CARES Act funding. I mean, it was like $950,000. But there's a lot of strings attached to that, to those dollars. So we, we're very limited on what we can do with that money. Yes, you cannot hire staff. We cannot hire staff. Even online staff to maintenance? By the program, but not. But the program comes with staff support, so that's. You're buying it's, the service. You're buying the service. You're buying the service. And, and they, it's included in the service. They so have a teacher account. out there somewhere, but we know that that teacher isn't going to be able to give the grades to the Norwood students follow up. And so we know that we have to have Norwood teachers right. in addition to that teacher that's out there somewhere. All right, so that's going to be on our agenda to take action on and, and approve on the 23rd. Sorry about saying the 24th. So we're not having a special meeting? No, no, we're going to have the special meeting, but the only thing on the special meeting um, just is just the approval of us voting on the back-to-school plan. So everything else will, will be on our regular board meeting. So now we'll move on to item 3.03 .03 in our agenda, and that's a construction update with uh, Mr. Peters. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to start, I'd say, the, the uh, up at Norwood View, the abatement, the scheduled abatement that's been going on uh, was completed last week, uh, which is good news because that means we no longer have to keep a uh, supervision, a guy on staff to make sure that all the protocols are being followed properly. Uh, so he's no longer needed there. He has been relocated here to the high school. Um, there is a transformer, a Duke Energy transformer that uh, up until now has been inside the building. Um, I've never really been crazy about that. So the, one of the changes in this project, I don't think Duke will put a transformer inside a building anymore, but one of the changes is that it will be relocated outside. It will be... Uh, if you can envision the parking lot, not exactly in the parking area, but if anybody knows the door that people use to go in and vote, uh, going into the auditorium on the parking lot side, it'll be off to the, to the right of that entrance. Um, but because it is close to or technically in a parking area, they had to put up ballards to uh, protect it from uh, anybody accidentally hitting it. 
Um, over at Sharpsburg, the sidewalk has been poured on Smith Road, um, which will be the apron where the drop-off lane will enter coming in off of Smith, which will go around to Forest Avenue. Uh, that was good to see late last week. Uh, the above ceiling inspection took place last week and uh, everything passed, everything went well on the ground floor, so the ceiling panels will start going in. That too, that floor is starting to look like, the, the upper floors have been looking like a school again for the past few weeks now that the ground floor is starting to look like a school, so that's very encouraging. Um, again on the ground floor, new VCT tile has been installed. Um, the art room was complete late last week. The uh, cafeteria was about half finished and I believe the music room was complete. So hopefully this week they're working on that hallway that connects um, basically the art room to the cafeteria there. Here at the high school, um, abatement is still taking place. Uh, currently they are in the band area up on the third floor. Um, now that the fourth floor is complete, we were able to turn the air handler back on on the fourth floor, um, which helps as far as the new flooring installation that's starting to take place up there. Um, as, as everybody knows, we moved from the gymnasium down here to the cafeteria. They now have got floor protection over the gym floor. Uh, and uh, they're ready to start getting work on that ceiling um, to bring down the, the foamy sound baffling that's up on the ceiling. Uh, one item I've got here is that the scraping in this ceiling here would be complete by tonight's meeting. Obviously it is. Uh, we're here. Um, I did meet with Pepper Construction uh, early last week or maybe the end of the week before uh, who will be doing the school-based health center. They are very interested to see the above ceiling in the office area to see what will be involved in some of the moving around they have to do in that area. Uh, I, I stopped in up there on my way down here tonight and I do see that they've got the one section of the main office area ceiling is down. They still have to do the area on the uh, vice principals or assistant principals areas. So hopefully that's still taking place here in the next few days. Um, the only other thing I'd like to mention is if anybody parked in the middle school side or if you walked, came down Sherman Avenue late last week, the fencing around the place set went up. So I think that looks really nice. I was impressed with that. Um, and I think that's all I've got. I have a question for you. Uh -huh. Is there any plan to redo work on the auditorium at View, or is it not being updated at all? It will like get the seats or uh, not. Not right now. No, the seats are not included. <coughs> okay. um, there is there is air conditioning going in there, okay. and they are scheduled to paint in there. Okay. If those seats ever go up, I think it'd be really cool to do a city auction for the seats because I know oh. I want some. Because I, I went to view. I like this. So I'm just saying, I think it'd be kind of neat, um, but let me know if those seats we'll do. go. <laughs> we are going to ask the board for informal direction on some projects that we've got, potential projects. Um, the architect, of course, since it's a construction project, we always need like immediate decisions. But we have several projects that we could add. One is the windows at Sharpsburg Primary to replace the glass block with a more period appropriate window. One is the windows at Williams, excuse me, supplies went crazy. Um, at Williams, the windows on the east side are part of the project to be replaced. The windows on the west wing are not. And so they will look slightly different. And then the third thing is we talked about our last meeting, the high school roof has had serious damage and must be replaced. We've asked our architect to go ahead and bid that for us because that's quite the project to scope out um, something of that magnitude. So with the board's um, informal decision, we will move forward and add those three things to our scope of work for our architect. We'll bring that architect contract to you at the meeting on the 23rd for your formal approval, but I would like to get them to go ahead to go ahead and do that now. Your informal decision only means that we're putting it in the architect's contract. That doesn't mean that we will actually do the work. Because what our plans are is to have the windows be bid as an alternate. So when we get the bid for Williams, um, the windows will be, um, for Sharpsburg and for Williams, will be an alternate. So we'll be OK 
tick yes to alternate A, yes to alternate B, something like that. So we'll, we'll have a good idea of price and how big of a project it's going to be before we say yeah or nay to it down the road when those are bid out. So as of right now, you're just giving me the informal yay or nay on do we move forward and put this in our architect contract for uh, two weeks from I have a question. Since we were talking about water bottle filler stations, would this be a good opportunity to request a bid for updating our water fountains to include at least one per floor water bottle station, um, since that's something that we're going to need? I know the high school has one up here, um, but that might be something if we're already putting out bids to our architect. With, with the remodel at the middle school, we already did put in bottle fillers. But with, with the, the with remodel the at Sharpsburgs, we, we did. Uh, about the only building that would still need to be looked at would be Williams and possibly here for some other uh, areas. Updating some here while they're doing the rest of the plumbing might be something we could look at. I, I think just, that's a small enough project that we could slide that into the scope without changing the architects. That would, be, that would be amazing to have prepped and ready for start of school, just so we have those extra water bottle, bottle, bleh, water bottle fillers, say that five times fast, well, we um, ready to go. Williams before then, well, not, unless it's something that maybe our people could, we, could We could probably do one or two at the building there. Yeah. So to, that okay. will be a priority for us, but I just don't think it's going to be big enough. To I didn't know if it was. Yeah. Okay. These are big things. When, and you have to change something big, like the roof or the windows or something, where it's going to be a, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollar project, and the architect has to put a lot more work into the scope. And that's when he changes the contract. You ask my contractors when I try to redo plumbing. <laughs> it's order. a big deal. Change order is a dirty word. It starts to understand. Like, oh, you want to do plumbing, huh? <laughs> So I'm, I'm in favor of going ahead and giving the informal approval okay. uh, to, to put that into the scope of work. If we get down to the end and, and we're struggling to bridge the gap between our capital improvement fund, there are some other funding options that we have access yes. to that, that we could utilize to, to bridge that gap. And I'm okay with that. Okay. Anybody have any real objections to adding it to the architect's contract to get more information on? We're good. Okay. This is a board that likes progress. All right, we'll put it on the agenda then for uh, the 23rd. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda, um, I would like to make a motion that we enter into executive session in accordance with uh, ORC 121.22 G6, which includes details relative to the security arrangements and emergency response protocols for a public body or a public office. Can I get a second? I'll second. Somebody second it? We second together. All right. Okay. Call the roll. Mr. Atwood? Yes. Mrs. Cole? Yes. Ms. Fowler? Yes. Mrs. Rager? Yes. Mrs. Rager? Yes. All right, it is 7.01 and we are in executive session.
All right, it is 7.14, and we are reconvening from executive session. So next on our agenda is um, section five, which is the education committee report. Um, Mrs. Rarica and Mrs. Ballard. We have our resolution for remote learning, which is that, um, what Shannon are you close about? It is, um, a resolution that we have to I think we brought it up at the last meeting House Bill 164 allows the a district the option of doing remote learning but it has to be in a resolution approved by the board and submitted to the Ohio Department of Education by July 31st so that's what this resolution says so that's why we're asking for your approval because we don't know what it could look like what our situation could be next year and we need to have the flexibility that we have a remote learning uh, program that's approved and, and allowable my understanding is ODE does not cannot turn it down once the Board of Education approves it we can do our remote learning plan so we I just, went to that webinar which was the day after our last uh, school board meeting and that was the one thing new thing that I learned that day that I hadn't told you about before was that we have to choose and it is sort of silly that they have these two options and one is called blended but it's not like the CPS blended and the other one's called remote and you have to say we're choosing blended or we're choosing remote and blended is a very rigid and doesn't let you be flexible whereas the remote lets you be flexible which is, I don't know why anyone would choose blended then. That's but. a good explanation, thank you. <laughs> so, so here's our resolution. Do you need me to read it or just like there it is? Well, this is the same, just about, we've tweaked it to include the Edgenuity program, but this is basically the same type of document we had to put together in the spring when we were suddenly thrown to remote learning. We had to issue a statement saying the district could support a online option of some mm -hmm. type here's what it is and then the state says okay cool you did a resolution and that's all it really has yes. to be yes you are correct we had to do one in the spring because we were trying to cover ourselves with the school closures because suddenly um, everything we're used to be it attendance or whatever is completely different so you have to have a resolution saying things have changed we're in a different model and submit it to ODE. So that is what Do this is. Do I need is. to read it, or you want me to read it? it? It's. I mean, it's. It's whatever the board desires. Right. It's. It's completely up to you. If you. If you want to. If you want to read it, um, you're, you're more than welcome to read it. It's. It, the. The resolution is there for us to. To, to view it's, and it's pretty discuss. Short. But if you want to read it for the benefit of. The viewers. The viewers. Usually, it does a pretty good job in the beginning, and then you don't have to go much farther after that. What so, whereas. whereas on June 29, 2020, House Bill 164 was passed by the Ohio General Assembly and signed by Governor DeWine on June 19, 2020, and whereas House Bill 164 allows school district in the state of Ohio to adopt a remote learning model for at least the 2021 school year and possibly beyond, and whereas the Norwood City School District does anticipate having a remote learning model using the Edgenuity software for grades kindergarten through 12 to serve the families in the city of Norwood wishing for a virtual or remote option. I think that's probably. Yeah, I think the rest that's it. So Mary, you brought up an interesting point about attendance requirements, and I know that certain families have mentioned the uh, the truancy uh, requirement and restrictions and how that's going to look. Um, I want to make sure that the families who are concerned about truancy are aware that the state issues uh, a very formal process when it comes to truancy and because the state isn't really in session right now, they can't vote to change the current truancy policy. So the majority of districts across the state of Ohio will be in non-compliance 
students will be missing school for beyond an acceptable period of time. Um, it's with online learning, they're not present daily in the classroom, so that attendance record is going to look different than a standard learning environment. Children who are out potentially with long-term illness or on quarantine are going to receive potentially letters saying that they are truant when in fact they are participating in medical leave or in an online format. So we are anticipating the state looking at that policy on truancy and issuing at least a 20 and 21 school year edit for what truancy policies might look like, but that for Norwood, if you get a letter, it, is, it does not mean that we are pursuing truancy impact on your student. It is an automatically sent thing, and we yes. cannot control that portion of things in the process, but we are aware of that potential change coming in the state, and we hope that that's something that is addressed as soon as they get back in session. I think that's what all 600 plus districts are hoping because we know that everyone's going to be out of compliance. That unpleasant letter that's sent out, it's not, we're required by law to do it. It's not something we enjoy sending to our parents, but we just follow the law. Hopefully things will change in the upcoming year because it's a very harsh letter that any child out on quarantine would be considered truant. So it all needs to change, but I just want parents to know that partially worded letter is directed by state law and not by the Norwood district. We just wouldn't write something like that unless required. Thank you for bringing that up. Parents are really dislike. It's a hard letter. letter. Yeah, I don't and it, it's triggered. I mean, we literally have to have it programmed that so many days out you get it because it's required by law. And that's just very unfortunate. I think that started two or three years ago. And I just don't think it's not good customer service. And it, But we're required to do it. We have to abide by the law. And that's why it goes out automatically. Even before, sorry. Even before I was on school board, I had to field parents with that and tell them what you were saying. I'm like, it's okay, it's not their fault. My first one went out to a little bit. Oh, right, right, Mr. Gallup always says I was the first one. And if we suspend a child, then we send them a letter saying, you're absent too much. Well, we know that. <laughs> but they make us count the child as absent, and therefore it triggers the letter. So it just makes us look foolish, like right. we don't know what we're doing, but in actual, in reality, we're following the, well, we're following the law. And those things affected our state report card, too. And yes. obviously that is also going to have to be discussed. But it's, I didn't want folks to think we were putting out one resolution for fall planning and forgetting about the potential truancy issues for fall planning. It is not something that we at this level can You're do. Right. We need to follow the state on that one, but we understand that truancy will be mentioned <laughs> by concerned parents who get letters that we can't control. Hopefully they'll have it resolved by September. One would hope. Hopefully they take a good look at that and see that it's terrible. It ruins relationships. It, it yes, it damages things. relationships and that's why I dislike that letter so much. And for the state to require that, it doesn't seem appropriate. It should be your school social worker following up with families, not issuing some horrible letter that you have to keep on file to prove that you've done it. All right, so that is going to be up for a uh, decision for us on the 23rd. Um, next on our agenda is item number six, and that's personnel superintendent running. Yes, um, in the first category um, on employment, uh, we have a number of contracts that are up. Oh, I'm sorry, 6.01. Let's start with resignations. I apologize. Um, we've had. Uh, two teachers who have uh, left Norwood because they have secured new positions. Um, Mr. Haas is going to be a, uh, an assistant principal out in Bethel Tate, so congratulations to him. So he has left us, and Kristen Post is moving out of town, so we wish her well in her, her new endeavors. And also uh, the resignation, uh, Mr. Reynolds has a new position from eighth, eighth grade uh, football coach. Then under employment, we have a number of administrative contracts that are coming up that are rolling over to be approved by uh, three of our administrators, Mrs. Chesson, Mr. Yates, and Mr. Lawson. Also, um, our attendance and student accounts coordinator, 
Mr. Krell. Our plumber, we um, were changing his dates of employment so that they align with all the other administrative contracts. That's really what that's about. Then, on teacher contracts, we have to list our the first year teachers, and I do want to mention down under under the boxes, we do have a new individual, a mathematics teacher, Kevin Bowman. He will, will be starting replacing Mr. Haas, who left on the previous page. So we'd like to welcome him to the district. Then we have our second year teachers, our third year teachers, and then our teachers who are receiving continuing contract. So that's what that list of names are. So that's under number four, teacher contracts. Then under number five, these are our educational age aides and student assistants who had the yearly non-renewal back in April. So obviously we need them back if we're coming back in person. So all of these individuals are being um, hired back. Then, Number five is resolution to hire non-certified coaches and advisors. So we have um, two individuals, Mike Edis and Chris Kelch. They are in our seventh and eighth grade, our middle school football program. And I believe that that is the end of this section. So as you can see, we have definitely geared up at the at the July meeting. Also, there'll be names in August as we bring people back for the start of school for the new school year. Mary, I wanted to make sure we clarify. Some folks are aware that we put on a hiring freeze order. A lot of these contracts are things that we have to do annually, and this yes. is a reiteration of contracts that are within the three year, they already had employment status, it's just changing their status to the new year. Yes. Um, and obviously replacing a math teacher is different than hiring a new additional teacher. So I didn't want folks to suddenly think that we were stepping out of that beyond what yes, we said we have a Yes, this is a replacement. A math teacher left, we had to hire a math teacher Correct. replacement. And these other, th all these teachers are all currently employed. They're yes. simply moving from their first year to their second year to their third year to continuing contract. And then once we're, they're on continuing contract, my understanding is we don't list them anymore. Correct. So something else to consider as we kind of navigate through this new normal. Um, as, as we start to transition back into fall sports, there are going to be a number of <clears throat> either volunteer assistant or you know halftime assistant positions with some of these teams that that you know aren't going to be on the agenda and are going to look like new hires, right? But in reality, those were positions that we had already approved, and at the beginning of the year, we're just filling those in. So I just want to make sure that people understand that, that we're not we're not out you know creating new jobs for people. These are just things to make sure that we have the adequate resources for our student athletes whenever we're able to you know put those teams together and go out there and do those things. I do have one ask for the meeting, um, the section for the not the rehire of the non renewals. Um, please keep that as a separate vote because I'll approve the rest of it, but that section I won't stay um, I do have a question about, you mentioned extra coaches and volunteer staff and things like that. This year is gonna need to look a lot different in terms of parent volunteers, um, folks that help with the field and stuff like that. Um, I, I would encourage parents to reach out to our athletic director for direction on how to do that safely. Um, so that way we're checking out parents, temperature checks, things like that, um, so that Anybody that wants to work directly with the kids at games is also following our safety protocol guidelines. Um, so maybe we can work with um, Alex Hines on establishing a protocol for parent volunteers oh. at games or sideline volunteers, anything like that that we might need. And 
asking what type yeah. of protocol, if any, will be run at our snack bar. It, are we even going to be considering opening our well, snack bar or sales? That's even if we're even allowed to have t-shirts or you know, spectators in the stands. Right. So we need to figure out what that might look like. But we well. might have to look for guidance from OHSAA because they have been extremely helpful, um, being consistent throughout the state. They have sent us the uh, protocols. They've sent us actually sample sheets. Here's what you you need to be asking all your players, asking all the coaches, the temperature check, what are your symptoms, all of those things. So I'm assuming a little bit, I would imagine that would also be forthcoming. Because would we be right able to get Alex here at the meeting to go over certainly all of those we could do that. plans for our sports from what that might look like for we, fall sports? We can certainly do that because he's done an excellent uh, job of tracking everything OHSAA has sent out, making sure all the coaches have it, keeping track of all our players who have started practice because we do have to make sure that they are symptom free. But yes, we can have him present at the July meeting if that's what you would like. That could all change. I mean, I don't know if you guys are aware or not, but uh, they just announced that OHSAA executive director has been like a so Jerry Snodgrass. I heard there was a, a change. I think yeah, there. Jerry Snodgrass is out, so they they've got an interim in there. And they're going to do a national search. I wouldn't run from the hall. What? <laughs> I simply. All right, uh, moving on, uh, item number seven on our agenda, uh, Finance Committee, Mrs. Campos. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm happy to say that the books are closed for fiscal year 20, and we have started on fiscal year 21. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really impressive. <laughs> My staff are so helpful and experienced, uh, they make the day-to-day -day work much easier. Um, the governor announced last week that he will keep school funding at the same reduced rate as last year until further notice. He is leaving his options open for further cuts during the year. Nor Norwood state funding was down almost 375,000 year over year or 4.75% from the prior year. Our state funding, in fact, for this past year was the lowest it has been in the past eight years. Fiscal year 13, we received 27,000 more than we did this past year. Norwood City Schools earned $915,000 in interest revenue this past school year. Of that, $409,000 was directed to the general fund and used to assist with instructional needs. Most of the rest of that interest revenue went to the construction fund and will help assist the district with finishing our renovation projects. For those of you interested in further finance-related facts, my CFO report is attached to the agenda tonight for your review, and that is I just put it on there today because we just closed out today. I expect to have the construction change order spreadsheets on the agenda in the next week for your review and approval at our next meeting. 7.02 temporary appropriations are budget for fiscal year 21 school year. 7.03 transportation contract with Peterman. We are approving the corrected con contract for this month for fiscal year 21. 7.04 transportation contract with Medicare for fiscal year 21. 7.05 new accounts. These are mostly new state and federal grant accounts. You are approving the fund, the receipt of the grant, and approving the budget for these grants for next year. 7.06 professional dues to approve the membership for the superintendent and the treasurer in their respective professional organizations. That is required by contract. That is all I have for finance. So, two items I just want to highlight in your report. Number one, the interest money that was earned, fantastic. It is awesome. I mean, that's that's another year where it's almost a million dollars in interest. Yes. On that, and that really helps us bridge the gap right. in order to get the construction project done. So. Yes. Uh, fantastic efforts there. The other thing I want to highlight is we will be, so in 7.05, um, one of the new accounts that we will be approving and accepting the funds for will be the, the CARES Act funding at $932,762.47. So, so we will be formally accepting that money and creating a space in our accounting system for that so we can begin dispensing that. 
recovery for some of the things that we've already spent. Anybody else have any questions, comments about finances? All right, next on our agenda is a motion to adjourn. Can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll second. Any discussion? Call a roll. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mrs. Cole? Yes. Ms. Bowen? Yes. Mrs. Rayburn? Yes. Mrs. Rare? Yes. And we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.